Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It's been another busy period on the energy front in South Africa, with an electricity tariff decision, various domestic energy gatherings, and a fresh volatility in energy prices following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss these developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Firstly, the energy regulator took a decision on the electricity tariff for 2022-2023. Yes, that decision has been sort of much anticipated because we know that Eskom applied for 20.5% for the single year. So starting on April 1 and for municipal customers, it will affect us from July. So there was a lot of uh, anxiety about what the increase would be. In the end, NERSA made a decision to limit the hike to a single digit hike. It's 9.6% from April 1. And that's made up of two components. And uh, the one component is a lot of legacy um, approvals that have been made under regulatory clearing accounts that have to be liquidated. So these are approvals that were made over a number of years. In fact, there was another one made in December that's not included in this figure. So that's a good portion of, of the increase because the actual allowable revenue increase uh, given by NERSA to Eskom for this year so that's looking at its costs uh, and also looking at issues of the regulatory asset base and the depreciation and all those components that Eskom was looking at was applying for something a reliable revenue of around 279 billion rand. Uh, that approval was actually for 250 billion rand from NERSA, which is effectively uh, a sub-inflation increase on the allowable revenue front. So um, Eskom is going to be getting a 3.5% hike for this year. In the context, as you mentioned in your intro, of very volatile and steeply rising energy prices, I mean, I'm sure it's very welcome for most South Africans to have a single digit hike, even though I see there's a lot of pushback even against the 9.6. But this is uh, quite uh, astounding because of the, the energy inflation in the system around the world, electricity, and gas and energy prices in Europe and North America are rising steeply. We see it at the fuel pump where it's more of a market mechanism, where, the, uh, where it's not as heavily regulated. So every month we get the increase and we're seeing how steeply petrol is rising. So for NERSA to approve in that context a sub-inflation increase for ESKIM is, is interesting. And they basically did that by looking at um, the regulated asset base of Eskom. And they basically took uh, Eskom's view that the regulated asset base is 1.3 trillion rand. They took uh, 550 billion off that and actually decreased it to a level of around 702 billion, which was lower than the regulatory asset base they approved for the current financial year. So it's a major decision. It's part of the regulatory discretion. They made it clear. And their argument is if you put three accountants in the room, you'll get three different figures. And their view was that they, this is a rational figure. That obviously has a knock-on effect all the way down. They gave Eskom a, a positive rate of return, which Eskom applied for a negative one, in a, bit of, a, a way to smooth the increase, which was a 22 billion swing, but not enough uh, after the, the, the big 555 billion sort of cut. And then at the depreciation line as well, there's a, there's, a, there's a much lower figure. So overall, that's how they basically reached this figure. Uh, on the actual primary energy and the operational cost, the deviation wasn't as large as what Eskom had applied for. So I think relief for South Africans at a single digit, still some opposition, as we see in Parliament this week, but quite surprising in a context where electricity prices um, not, not, you know, discounting what's happening in the fuel private electricity prices are rising really, really steeply and well above inflation in the rest of the world. Then the issue of South Africa's future electricity mix came under the spotlight at a couple of energy gatherings over the past week and a bit. Yes, um, the Central Energy Fund uh, hosted a gathering, a dialogue with the Energy Minister, and then there was the Africa Energy in Daba this week, so lots of uh, talk about South Africa's energy future not just the electricity future, but obviously given the crisis in the electricity area, that's a, that's a big focus. And really looking at that mix, um, Minister Gwede Mantash pushing very hard for a mix, uh, saying we can't swing like a pendulum uh, from coal to renewables, and that we need a balance that includes 
coal. Some, and he's talking still about clean coal, although such technologies are not clear where they exist internationally. But there is this um, uh, tender that will come out for 1,500 megawatts of coal. It's going to be interesting to see if that can be financed, what technologies will come forward. Uh, I think many of us have our doubts that any clean coal will come through that process at a reasonable cost, but uh, it will be interesting to see. He talks about the need for much more gas in the system and pushing very hard for domestic gas. You know, there's this, this debate about how South Africa should integrate more gas into the system. There's a view that, well, we need 3,000 uh, megawatts of gas to powers in the RP. How do we actually get the gas molecules? We know that the uh, Pandy and Tamane fields uh, from southern Mozambique are tapering. So there needs to be a fill-up there uh, to get us through this period of not only giving the industrial um, consumers in Gauteng and in KwaZulu-Natal security of supply, but also uh, to give um, uh, these new electricity plants uh, gas to run on, uh, as well as the, the, the desire to convert the open cycle gas turbines from diesel to gas. So there's these many uh, sort of potential consuming sites for gas. And so where's the gas going to come from? Some studies say the lowest risk approach would be to really focus on uh, liquefied natural gas, so uh, importing LNG through terminals in Maputu, Richards Bay, Kucha, Saldana Bay, and that's what we should be focusing on. The reason why it's low risk is that there is going to be a, a real a pressure around stranded assets in the future as uh, people transition not only away from coal, but eventually from all fossil fuels. But that's got a longer time horizon, so gas has got a longer time horizon. The issue now is you've got the re Ukraine crisis, and uh, we've already had an announcement out of Germany where they're going to be building two LNG terminals to try and limit the amount of um, pipe gas from, from Russia to reduce their dependence on Russia. And uh, the rest of Europe, too, is looking at LNG terminals. So now there's going to be a lot of scrambling for new import terminal capacity, including from South Africa, all at the same time. It's going to raise the costs. And then obviously the domestic gas resources are so immature still, you know, the ones that have been found in, in Broadpada, for instance, and then they're doing some more survey work, which is very, very early stage. So we don't really know, other than Broadpada and Leopard, that we've got a lot of gas. There might be gas in the Karoo. But this is going to involve massive capital investments, and it's going to lock you into a gas industry. So there's some concern uh, about what that means in terms of um, the par uh, not only Paris, but the Glasgow commitments to decarbonisation, a 1.5 degree world. The IPPCC uh, report came out this week showing that we're spending far too little on adaptation and that even there's limits to adaptation, uh, that actually we need to get a car decarbonisation accelerated because once you go beyond that one and a half degree threshold, the amount of money you need to spend on adaptation for, for the limited returns is, is just extreme. So it's, it's a big discussion. Uh, it's, these are big decisions to be made, and there's so many different moving parts. But the minister across all these forums was very firm on South Africa's need for uh, a mix that includes coal, and he doesn't want to really see a very rapid ex des um, accelerated transition away from coal. He's saying sustain these coal assets. He's saying that Eskom will be converting some of that coal to gas, but also generally RPP gas. And then he's also pushing hard for nuclear in that mix. So this is sort of where we at, even though many of the studies are showing that have come out, independent studies from various organizations, that actually the focus should be on solar wind and storage at a much accelerated pace. Uh, this is where, unfortunately, the, the debate is being dragged back into the, the, the sort of very fossil intensive, quite backward looking in some ways. And then nuclear at the moment, I see other countries are also looking at nuclear, given what's happening in Russia. Even Germany is talking about uh, sustaining some of their nuclear, which is a big change. So uh, nuclear, the issue there is how much it's going to cost uh, us to consume new nuclear. Obviously, Kuburg which is, uh, which is uh, the process of being extended, is low cost at the moment. Its costs will go up as they extend the life. And uh, that looks like it's baked in, even though there's critics of that. 
But other than that, new nuclear looks very, very expensive. Also under intensifying discussions is South Africa's approach to the just energy transition. Yes, I think it's that many South Africans are quite confused and international and local investors are quite confused about our approach because really this has been very, very energetically driven out of the first, the National Planning Commission, the second one, where we now into the third uh, iteration of the, the National Planning Commission, then taken up very, very uh, assertively by the Presidential Climate Commission, which really did a lot of work uh, in the run-up to COP26 around blending South Africa's just transition approach, which was nascent, and there's a lot of work still to, to do around our just transition conceptually, and uh, blending that with what Eskom was doing, and then therefore having an offer that we could that was very tantalising that we could make to the world with a with a much more uh, progressive, nationally determined contribution uh, outline at that conference. We might had this offer of 8.5 billion, which now has to be converted, and we see that an uh, individual from the, in the presidency will have to run with this and try and convert the offer into real transactions, either in the form of grants or in the form of concessional loans, which would probably be the bulk of it, and then directing it to the... the unfortunately, I think the water's a little bit muddied uh, between electricity, electric vehicles and hydrogen. Clearly, electricity is the biggest game in town. And if you don't get that sorted out, you can't sort out the other two. So that really should be the focus. And I think there is a, a shifting back towards the electricity focus for that concessional finance. But, you know, what we have now is the PCC putting out a framework on the just energy transition for public comment. And we've got uh, the DMRE putting out a just energy transition framework for energy and mining. Now, in principle, it's not a problem that we have a sectoral focus, so long as these are aligned. And uh, I think we are already seeing a misalignment in the statements that Minister Mantash is making relative to the statements that the Presidential Climate Commission is making on this issue. And that divergence really needs to be brought uh, into alignment. Because if we don't have alignment, it's going to be very hard to make our case. It's going to be, you know, uh, to the international community to convert uh, this offer of um, 8.5 billion into real transactions. And I think it just causes a lot of confusion. I think that so long as it's clear that the PCC framework, which is going to go to cabinet later this year, is the guiding one, and it's not going to be cannibalized by a separate framework, and I think that's fine, and we have a focused energy and mining framework. But I think at this stage, it looks like a bit of a, an attempt to capture the concept. And it is a very contested concept, not only a contested concept in South Africa, but in many other countries. And it would be quite uh, ironic if the, um, uh, the just energy transition debate becomes captured in a way that basically delays the decommissioning of coal. And if it is captured in that way, then I think we won't see the support that we were promised uh, in Glasgow. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.